But I, I, at the moment, I mean, one, looking at uh, the way it is structured now, uh, it does appear, I mean, the, the Minister of Finance was talking about how much has been uh, released. She said it was cash backed when she was asked by the Senate. But the states, many of these communities uh, you speak about, they all uh, exist in the states. How much do you think the states are doing now, in spite of the fact that they say, look, we have a challenge of payment of salaries? Do we think that they can do as much as they can to ensure that um, at least we reduce our uh, overdependence on this forex? Well, look, overdependence of forex is another dimension of the lack of capacity to make institutions work. For instance, look, let me just so do getting us out of this economic situation that we're in. Yes, I know. We, 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 we say forex, 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 okay? We have a currency it's called the Naira. If we use it, if we allow the, the points of production across the economy, and there are many of them, they are not producing optimally. If we allow them to produce at their maximum, at their most technical efficiency, we will have more wealth generated locally before you even start talking of forex. Forex is very important, but I think you have deeper problems around the forex. Inflation in Nigeria is not due only to forex. It's probably 50, at most 50%, and I've said this here before. The other 50% of your inflation in Nigeria is caused by artificial inflation. You have inflation that is driven by demand and supply, what you call market forces, right? But you have another, you know, say you have, if I have 10,000 10, 10, naira, I'm able to buy five things instead of ten things because the other five I cannot buy is being taken away by the artificial inflation I'm paying on everything. I'm not talking normal inflation. I'm talking the extra on top, okay, which has been part. Look, take diesel, take kerosene. Can anybody explain to me why diesel and kerosene right now should be costing what they're costing? They've gone in the last four months, they've gone like hundred percent, 150 percent. I thought many supported that deregulation such that no, uh, to be driven by was, market forces. It was only the petrol in your car that was deregulated where they removed subsidy. I'm not aware officially of subsidy, sta the st subsidy status of kerosene and diesel haven't changed. Have you had the NMPC say we have removed some subsidy from those, diesel? Those were deregulated before the petrol. Yeah, long ago, yeah. long ago. But what I'm saying is, as soon as the deregulation of petrol happened, and I can understand why we went from 97 to 145, but I cannot understand how, why and how we went from for diesel from 120 to 220 now. From uh, kerosene is more than 100 percent because nobody has deregulated those ones officially. They did the deregulation long ago. So why? Why do we have this job? It's because there's too much speculation within our economy, within our pricing structure, within our pricing processes. Too much greed, too much speculation. And what does that do? It undermines the growth of the economy. I'll tell you how it does it. If I buy five things instead of 10, mm -hmm. with my 10,000, it means you have reduced another 100% from my purchasing and demand capacity in the economy. Multiply that by 50 million people and look at how we are undermining the economy. Uh, we, Government should do something about it. Do you think we're focusing on you know, uh, ensuring that the manufacturing sector gets us out of the woods enough? You, the, the manufacturing sector, you see, maybe let's, let's break down the nature of our economic problem. We have some that I call immediate, immediate. Stop. How do you deal with mass poverty? How do you deal with this crazy uh, artificial inflation? How do you deal with small businesses that are closing everywhere? That's the short term. There is the medium term. This industrialization thing, manufacturing, falls into that. It's like your diversification. You will not, the economy will not get any benefit in return for all those ones until about four years, five years down there. So these are medium term goals. Okay, they will not help you solve today's problem. Then you even have the longer term goals. How are we going to prepare our economy for what is now common, commonly called the fourth industrial revolution? Do you understand? 
Are we preparing our educational system, our tertiary system, our technical training system to prepare this country for the robotics revolution that just down the line? In other words, we're supposed to have identified a particular area of focus and then build all these institutions to strengthen them, both in the long term. But how do you do that in the immediate term? In the immediate to have term, an impact. The, the first thing, because look, people are hurting a lot, too badly. In the immediate term, the first thing is look at those who are already producing in the economy. You wake up in the morning, what do you see? 4 a.m. people are out there running. Nigerians are not lazy, for God's sake, right? What do we do to help add value, enhance the amount of production that is there? A lot of it is in the informal sector. A lot of it is in the small business formal sector. Put together, I call that the bottom of the pyramid economy. How can you make that economy deliver its most potential now? Because people are already involved. They are not going to be involved tomorrow. It's not uh, uh, solid mineral. It's not. How do you have that? That's number one. Number two, how do you sit on top, press down, take away artificial inflation? Artificial inflation is a real and present danger. Okay. Let's go quickly, Mark Wayne. Mark Wayne? So that's the reason I'm curious as to how you have government handle what you term. Is it over speculation, too much speculation, causing that artificial, uh, artificial inflation? They can do it. For instance, look, if you want to buy any of these heavy, look, there are three areas. I'm not saying everything. If you want to buy necklace and hair product or, you know, the finest, you know, designer shoes, maybe government can let you still go on paying artificial inflation on top of regular inflation. But in the critical areas, food, you know, fuels, you know, petrol, diesel, kerosene, that people's life depend upon, and food, fuel, and uh, what is the third one? Transport. Okay? In those three areas, I, look, I'm not even uh, suggesting it. I'm proposing that government should go vigorously out and go after all the sources and the dynamics producing artificial inflation in those sectors so that you can allow and I, i'll give you an example go to britain you have off what that is britain who that is already advanced and everything but they still they still enter into the market government and still regulate certain things you have off what that is the body that regulates those who supply water but we so that you cannot overcharge people what about our regulatory bodies are they, are they not doing the same thing yeah i've talk, we've talked about the institutions how they are not really working in the interest of national then you have Oftel to make sure that people don't overcharge consumers in britain on telecommunication service you have off ed to make sure that the uh, educational system the private schools don't overcharge and the private universities you, this is britain they are intervening let the government of Nigeria intervene forcefully, ruthlessly, to stop artificial inflation. Is cutting in half sure, what sure. all of us can consume. Because when you have 10,000, your 10,000 should be able to last one week in your pocket in last three days. Mm. It's undermining demand in right. the system. Okay, Mr. Balaji Ogunshe, development economist, we appreciate your coming on today.